Hi and welcome back. This is part 3 in a small series of videos I'm doing on heat treating steel. In part 1 we looked at heat treating carbon steel and in part 2 we looked at phase changes. And in this video I'd like to go over alloy and tool steel. Sort of what makes them special and why heat treating them can be easy, difficult or different compared to a normal carbon steel. And by alloy steel, we're usually using it to refer to alloys where at least 1% of it is made up of something other than iron or carbon. Now the first thing to remember, at least from a design point of view, is that alloy steel is generally only going to be used if plain carbon isn't going to cut it. And this tends to hold true in the real world. I mean most steel that you find is going to be some type of mild or other type of carbon steel. Whether it's construction grade, tube, pipe or plate. Most of that's just going to be regular carbon steel, and that's because it's cheap, it's mass produced, and it's generally going to be strong and tough enough for 90% of applications. You know, alloy steel on the other hand, whilst still produced in large quantities, it's nowhere near as much as carbon steel, and the stuff that you're putting into it to alloy it is going to be more expensive than iron. So if you are going to use it, there better be a good reason for it. It's not really the focus of the video, but take stainless steel for example. That stuff is at least 10 or 11% chromium, and I don't know the going price of it, but it's going to be at least several thousands of dollars per tonne, compared to say, 100 or so for iron ore. So, unless you really need stainless steel, or you need to show it off, it's generally going to be a lot cheaper to use mild steel and just galvanise or powder coat it or paint it. And apart from corrosion resistance, there are other reasons to alloy steel, and that's generally going to be to improve its hardenability, toughness, strength, wear resistance, and also help prevent it from softening at high temperatures. So effectively, you could have two steels of similar hardnesses, but if you were to hit one with a hammer, it might shatter and fracture, but if you have a high toughness alloy, it may not. With all that said, hardness is generally going to be down to the amount of carbon, in the same way that it would be in a regular carbon steel, and as well as that, carbon for the most part is going to be the big determining factor for most properties of steel. And whilst there are a lot of elements that you can use to alloy steel, the main ones are going to be manganese, nickel, molybdenum, vanadium, cobalt, and silicon. And each of them will affect steel in certain ways, and they're commonly alloyed with each other to produce certain alloys with certain advantages. One example being chrome and vanadium will alloy to make your chrome vanadium steels, and they're used in a lot of mass produced tools since they have good toughness. Another one is chrome and molybdenum, they make chromoly steel, you know, your 4130s, 4140s, and they're a very common general purpose high strength alloy. And if you add a bit of nickel to that, it'll increase the toughness, and that'll get you your nickel chromium molybdenum alloys. 4340 for example. And if you follow the SAE designations, that's the four number callouts that I usually use for metal, you can very quickly deduce what sort of steel that you're dealing with, since the first two numbers will designate the alloy type, and the last two will designate the carbon content. So 4140 is going to be a chromoly steel with 0.4% carbon. Now alongside these alloy steels, we also have tool steels, which are generally alloys, but their main goal is intended for making tools, whether they be cutting tools, or injection moulding dies, or stamps. And like the general alloy steels, they're specifically alloyed to produce steels with favourable properties for certain jobs. Now in total, there's about 11 different categories of tool steel, each of them will have their own specific characteristics, and each of them will have various sub-alloys. And instead of being designated by numbers, it usually has a letter of some sort. The common ones are going to be W steels, which are water hardening, O for oil hardening, S for shock resistant, A for air hardening, D for high strength cold working, H for hot working, and T and M is going to be your high speed steels. And if you've watched my channel or any other of the hobby machinists, you probably would have heard of O1 or W1 tool steel. These two alloys are really popular because you can machine them soft and then very easily heat treat them to make them hard and usable tools. Now for what it's worth, W1 is nothing to write home about because it's not really an alloy steel, it's just high carbon steel with a small amount of manganese added in. And as a result, you harden it the same way that you would any other carbon steel, which is to simply quench it in water if you're looking to achieve maximum hardness. 
And really, the only reason why I buy it is because I don't have to case harden it like I do a lot of the other steel, and it's generally quite cheap and it does do the job. However, because I am quenching it in water, the risk of the part distorting if I don't get it cooled evenly is relatively high. And if that happens, I either have to re anneal it and reshape it, or I have to grind it into shape. The part can also crack due to the thermal shock or if the part is warping too much and if that happens, that is pretty much a scrapped part. Now to get around that, I could quench it in oil but the rate of cooling is about a third so whilst the thermal shock is going to be less, the final hardness is also going to be reduced and the amount that it is reduced is generally going to be determined by the oil but also by the mass of the part. The smaller the part means the closer I can get to the max hardness that I could get with water cooling. With small parts I can generally get close to 65 Rockwell C hardness, but as the part grows the hardness does tend to drop into the mid 50s. Now if I'm not looking to get the maximum hardness then that probably won't be an issue because I can simply temper it back to what I need and go from there. But if it isn't hard enough, I can then switch over to using our O1 or oil hardening steel. O1, since it is oil hardening, can be quenched in oil and it can still achieve the same hardness as our W1. And the reason that it can do this is down to some added manganese, chromium and tungsten. And what that does is it effectively increases the amount of time that we have to cool down the steel but achieve the same amount of hardness. With W1 or regular carbon steel, we need to get it cooled from red hot to about 200 degrees in the span of a second. With our O1 steel, it's closer to about 9 seconds. So effectively, we're able to cool it slower, risk less distortion, yet still achieve our high hardness. Now this range of time that we have to cool it down is known as hardenability, or at least it is related to it, and it has nothing to do with the total hardness that we can get. High carbon steel for example, whilst it can get very hard, has very poor hardenability because we need to cool it down very fast to form martensite. Now the big advantage to having these high hardenability steels is that if regular room temperature oil is still too much of a thermal shock, like it was when I made the knife a few weeks back, it means I should be able to quench it in hot oil, say between 150 to 200 degrees Celsius, while still being able to form that high hardness. The big advantage to this obviously is the thermal shock is going to be less because the rate of cooling is going to be reduced but we still have all that time available to form that martin site. And even still, if the risk of distortion is still too great, we can always use an air hardening steel which is even more hardenable and it allows us to cool it down even slower while still achieving our high hardness. This is really useful for parts that would otherwise be very difficult to grind in if they warped during heat treatment. However, it's not all positive. You know, for one, getting your hands on these specific alloys can be very difficult, especially if you're a hobbyist and you only need a small amount for a specific tool. W1 and O1 and maybe D2 are the more easy ones to get, but once you start trying to source air hardening or the hot working steels, they can be quite difficult to get your hands on. It's also important to point out that whilst cooling them can be a lot easier, prepping them and heating them up can be a real issue. Because as we know with carbon steel, the big interaction is going to be between the iron and the carbon. All we're doing there is cooling it as fast as possible to form martensite. But with alloy steel, we have all these other elements in there with the ferrite, plus a lot of other carbides, and some of these elements are there specifically to slow the rate of diffusion of the carbon out of the austenite. That's the reason why we're able to cool it so slowly. But this can also work against us when we try to heat up the steel and reset the microstructure. So effectively what this means is that the temperature we heat it up to, hold it at and for how long can be very important when heat treating these types of alloy and tool steels. If we underheat it or under soak it, it can result in incomplete martensite transformation, but if we overcook it or overheat it, it can result in a lot of retained austenite and that'll reduce the hardness. Now for what it's worth, O1 isn't all that affected. Just heat it up to red, maybe hold it there for a minute or so, and then quench it in oil, and you're gonna get very close to the maximum hardness that you're looking to get. However, other alloys, such as D2 for example, can be a lot more difficult to get correct because what it calls for is about 15 to 20 minutes of soaking at 1000 degrees 
And if you go under that, it's gonna show up as a dip in the hardness. High speed steel is also no different. It wants a minute or so at 1300 degrees Celsius. And that probably explains why I could never get it properly hardened in my workshop. And managing that critical temperature is not that easy with my setup. And as a result, I could never get it past say 50 or 55 Rock or C hardness when what I was really aiming for was 65 plus. Now, if you're wondering what temperature you need to heat your alloys up to, each manufacturer should have a data sheet printed out on their website, listing all the temperatures and the soak times. Now, the final big thing I want to talk about is sort of predicting the microstructure that we might get. And this can all be done looking at these two graphs. The one on the left is a time, temperature and transformation graph. And the one on the right is a continuous cooling transformation graph. These are generally shortened to TTT or CCT. And they effectively tell us the transformation of the microstructure at a given rate of cooling or if the metal is held at a specific temperature for a certain amount of time. If you've done a materials class, you'll probably know all about these and how much of a nightmare they can be when you first learn about them. They probably could take up their own one hour videos each. So for sake of clarity, let's focus on a simplified CCT diagram, which represents the phase change as we continuously cool a metal, say in water or oil or air. The Y axis is our temperature and the X axis represents time. But as you will see, the time is logarithmic. So on the left hand side, it deals with the phase change in the time scale of a second versus hours or days when you get to the right. Now if we cool it down quickly, the line is going to pass through the region where the austenite transforms into our hard marnsite, and it will eventually leave us with only marnsite, which represents the hardest state. This is effectively what we get when we water quench steel. However, if we start to cool it down slower, maybe using an oil quench, you can now see that we've passed through the region where ferrite and cementite is able to form. Ferrite and cementite together will be less hard than the martensite. However, the transformation is not 100%, so by the time we get to the end, there's still a bit of austenite left to form our hard martensite. As a result, the microstructure will be made up of ferrite, cementite, and martensite, and that results in a hard-ish steel, depending on how much martensite is formed. So a faster cooling oil will result in more martensite being formed, and as a result, the final steel will be closer to the water quench. And finally, if we slow cool it, say in a furnace or in air, we'll pass the martensite region and go directly into the region where all we're able to form is ferrite and cementite, and that's gonna be our softest annealed state. Now effectively what we're trying to do with hardenable alloys is trying to shift these boundaries. Like I said before with carbon steel, we only have about a second or so of time before the softer perlite starts to form. But with the more hardenable steel, we should be able to increase this window of time in order to cool it. With all that said though, this graph is incredibly oversimplified and it also doesn't get into bainite, but if you're not looking to form it, it probably doesn't matter. It also doesn't cover specific grain growth or diffusion that might be needed to achieve certain properties in some steels. Effectively what this means is water quenching isn't always going to give you the best result. And once again, each manufacturer should provide guidelines on heat treating certain alloys and what sort of properties you're trying to get. So I want to finish off this video by getting in two other points that I wasn't really able to squeeze in in other parts of this video. The first one is a question that I get asked a lot if I'm grinding up high speed steel, and that's, am I ruining the tamper of high speed steel if it gets sort of straw colored or blue when I'm grinding it? And the answer is no, not really. You know, high speed steel is one of these alloys that is able to resist losing its tamper at high temperatures. And as a result, when I'm grinding it, say on the bench grinder, if it becomes straw colored or even starts to go blue, it's not gonna be a huge problem. High speed steel is an amazing material and you don't tend to lose hardness until you reach about 500 to 550 degrees Celsius or even higher if you mix in a bit of cobalt. So for the most part, when I'm grinding up high speed steel, the heat is never a big issue. I've always said that the heat is probably gonna hurt you long before it ruins the temper. The second point here is also probably not going to be too important if you're just doing heat treating by the book because the manufacturer will take all of this into account. 
but not all of the austenite is going to be transformed back into ferrite or martensite when you quench it. Most of it does, at least in most steel, but some percentage can be retained at room temperature. This stuff here is called retained austenite, and for the most part, it's probably not worth worrying about in the home workshop, but in the industry, there can be strict requirements about reducing it in heat treated parts, because it can affect the overall strength of the steel. Now one way to get rid of it is to simply freeze it in liquid nitrogen, and then we'll transform it back into ferrite and cementite. Now obviously, I'm sure a lot of you are like me and you don't have liquid nitrogen just on hand, so the other way to get rid of it is to temper it, usually in multiple temper cycles, and that can reduce the amount of retained austenite. Although once again, this will be specific to each type of alloy. And it's also worth pointing out that this can and does happen in a lot of carbon steel too. And that's about it for now guys. I hope you enjoyed this video, as well as the whole series doing a quick dive into heat treatment. Of course, this is only a brief look into some forms of heat treatment. There is a lot of information still out there, as well as information on heat treating things that are not steel. So cast iron I wasn't able to get into, as well as all the non-ferrous metals. I hope to be able to cover those one day, but at least for the moment, I think it's about time that we got back into doing proper machining. So that should be next week. Until then, take care.